Thank you, and I'm very glad to be here this morning um, on the social morning, as well as on the last morning. Uh, given that this is uh, the social session, as it were, I have a, a fairly distinct sense of preaching to the choir. Uh, I think many of the things that I will say will be uh, closely held values for many of the people in the room, but I feel nonetheless that at this stage of the conference, it's important to rehearse them. I'm going to speak this morning on uh, this idea of the social life of urban form, and in particular, three key characteristic features of urban form. And my text is taken, doubtless as at least some of you will recognize, from one of the first urban sociologists, the early 20th century Chicago school thinker, Lewis Wirth, who in a classic essay in the interwar period, Urbanism as a Way of Life, outlined what he saw as what was distinctive about the urban of life in cities as a form of human settlement, as a form of social relationship. Now, Worth is no longer a particularly fashionable thinker in uh, the urban social sciences. But I think that his fundamental categories for thinking about the nature of the city remain relevant today, not least because they give us a simple basis from which to begin a conversation. And the thing that I take, continue to take from Worth, through the rather creaky distinctions he makes at times between living in an urban context and living in non-urban, for him, rural settlements, is that the modern city, and for that uh, matter, the ancient city, is distinguished as a form of human settlement that is based not on any form of communal or group tie at a mass level, but is based on sharing territory. So he's contrasting a way of living together in a particular set of relationships, a particular set of spatial arrangements, which are based not necessarily on our group or our tribal or our communal ties to each other, but on the fact that we are co-located. Uh, we may not know each other, but we are sharing a territorial space. So for him, in this um, stereotypical or ideal typical way, the city as a form of settlement is one that is based not on pre-existing group ties. We have to make our ties to each other uh, through our life in cities, integrating with many strangers, even as we live alongside others like us, known to us, perhaps related to us. So these three concepts, size, density, and diversity, were for worth and for me the elements that characterize the urban as a form of human settlement and a way of life. And I want to take these three observations, empirical observations, about what the urban is like as a set of social values of economic and environmental goods. Size, density, and diversity. Simply put, with a three um, degree zero features of urbanism as a way of life. Size and density may be more obvious to us. Cities tend to concentrate large numbers of people and they tend to pack them in fairly tightly, as we heard in the previous session. Diversity is already a far more socialized concept. Cities also tend to concentrate differences. Economic differences, class differences, cultural and linguistic differences, differences of race and ethnicity. These are the kinds of social effects that cities routinely do. And this is useful for thinking about uh, the urban as a way of life, I think, um, even across the varieties of urban form, of urban size, um, of urban economy that we're dealing with in a conference such as this. So my central message today is that these physical and spatial facts about living in an urban settlement are social forms with social meanings and social impacts. The basic elements of urban form are expressions of and conditions for social relations and social organization. 
So this is the sociologist's message. And Rob Neuwirth said uh, just now that cities are not fundamentally built forms, which I immediately scribbled down on my notes. Um, this is music to the ears of a sociologist. Cities are not fundamentally built forms. Cities are fundamentally social forms, and everything else follows from that. Now, it's understandable that built forms the creation, the regulation, the planning of physical spaces becomes for policymakers um, and other experts a kind of proxy for interventions in the social. But it should not be mistaken for the social itself. And neither can we be very confident of pursuing social ends through physical means. Rather, I would say that the challenges of urban design and planning become not simply a question of designing for social life and social behavior, but designing from and in response to the social. So I want to leave Worth at this point, but continue to steal his categories um, and put them into a conversation with another triad that we've been very used to discussing uh, for the last couple of days and more generally uh, in any forum connected to UN agencies. That is, I want to think about this urban triad of size, density, and diversity in relation to our own form of motherhood and apple pie, the economic, environmental, and social arguments that can be made for them. Firstly then, how can we think about the characteristic forms of urban life as economic values? Uh, arguments from economy for the size, the density and the heterogeneity of cities are well established and they're relatively easy to make. And we've heard quite a bit about them in uh, the, the workshop sessions so far. There are simply economic returns to city size understood in terms of growth measures uh, that link city size with income and productivity. This is true up to a certain point and up to a certain density. And there, are, there is, of course, beyond that sweet spot, a point at which large cities become economic, uh, economically inefficient, economic bads in certain ways. But nonetheless, there is a, a well-established body of research uh, literature that links city size um, with economic value and productivity. In respect of density, cities are organized around thick labor markets, consumer, product, and service markets, which tends to increase choice, reduce costs, um, bring many different buyers and sellers of many different things together in uh, densely populated spaces, whether in so-called formal or less formal economic exchanges. Density is also seen as uh, a key factor in promoting innovation, skill, and learning. We heard Bruce Katz talking about uh, the innovation district in cities, but cities can be seen as in innovation districts in and of themselves. And it's important to note uh, the relevance of diversity here. Cities tend to do well economically, not simply because they are dense, they pack many people together, but they pack many different people together. People with different skills, uh, people with different needs and wants, uh, people with different offers in various kinds of market exchange. So the density of difference is crucial to the economic vitality of cities. Understood whether at the um, high end of urban economies in the financial sector, uh, which I was just visualizing previously, or in the more everyday economies of cities, uh, in workplaces, in marketplaces, in sites of exchange. Environmental arguments to move on to the second element of our uh, closely held triad. Um, are more contested. Cities are not straightforwardly environmental goods, but nonetheless are difficult to dismiss. And while there is a huge amount of debate around the economic values of urban settlement, uh, it is rather uh, hard simply to reject outright arguments for the economies and the ecologies of scale 
the urban life produces. Larger cities, or cities of various sizes, can sustain systems of mass transit, shared energy, and water infrastructures. Dense cities promote non-motorized transport alternatives. They draw down less land from the urban hinterland than more sprawling settlement forms. And diversity can also be seen as an economic, as an environmental good, excuse me. Well-used urban spaces that include different kinds of users at different times of the day, uh, pursuing different activities in the same spaces, um, can be seen as an environmental good as compared to monofunctional, underused, um, and poorly occupied spaces. So on these fronts again, the urban can be seen as um, embedding, containing environmental values. The third element of our triad, however, the social, which is my particular concern, is much harder to maintain. Social arguments for the benefits of urbanism, the benefits of living together in larger population groups, of living densely and living with diversity, are hard to make and to maintain. Evidence is patchy or contradictory. Uh, arguments are highly contested. Different and irreconcilable positions are taken. On the positive side, social arguments for the benefits of urban form tend to emphasize uh, urban tolerance, the way in which cities which are dense and heterogeneous create spaces opportunities, economic, social, and cultural, and produce amenities for different kinds of people. Different groups can find different things in a dense and diverse city. It allows for uh, the pursuit of forms of life, including subcultural forms of life, um, within spaces that are held collectively, if not necessarily used in common. The kinds of goods that public spaces offer include these spaces of conviviality and exchange, of respite, um, of the interstices that allow for accommodations within an overdeveloped city, uh, for the coexistence of different uses and different users in the same spaces, but sites also for protest, assembly, and representation. On the negative side, however, these very same kinds of social values around density and difference can be seen as the basis for conflict, for segregation and division, for insecurity and stark forms of inequality. Ultimately, then, these are arguments that cannot be decided by recourse to trumping research evidence or cast iron facts. With all due respects to the fact that this session is known as the Urban Lab, these arguments are not winnable on the basis of empirical evidence alone. These are value commitments and political positions. They have to be fought for. If we think that urban forms and the public spaces um, which they contain are social goods as well as economic and environmental benefits. This is a principled commitment uh, on the part of certain groups who will be opposed by others. It's not an easily winnable argument. We know that cities routinely get these kinds of things right, promoting tolerance, the coexistence of diversity, the um, dynamic intersection of difference. But too often cities get these relations wrong. And too often, they get them wrong too persistently for the same groups of people in the same kinds of spaces. So public space is crucial for thinking about the city, urban forms of settlement as a social good. It opens up breathing space. It opens up meeting space. It opens up spaces for social and economic lives, which are lived at least partly in common whatever the differences and divisions between us. It provides spaces for the socialization of children. Indeed, it provides spaces for the socialization of adults. It provides spaces for assembly, representation, and protest, for trade and social exchange, for mobility and respite, 
for interacting with and for ignoring others, for belonging in a city in the most mundane ways, without papers, without title, and without payment. So if we care about these as social values, as economic goods, as environmental effects, but if we care about these kinds of qualities as spatial rights, then we may need to work harder to argue for, as well as to plan and design, but overall to maintain, protect, and defend the spaces in which these values are expressed and in which these spatial rights may be claimed. Thank you. Thank you.